Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Iman Babai. I'm in the first year of my uh, PhD. I'm uh, part of the Marie Curie PhD project named uh, ICONIC, which stands for uh, Improving the Crash Forcing of Composite Transportation Structures and aiming to build a new generation of the composites for uh, uh, to improve the uh, occupant safety in the transportation uh, vehicles. The project uh, consists of uh, uh, nine uh, beneficiaries in six uh, European countries. I'm uh, hosted in uh, CRF, Fiat Research Center here in Torino, and at the meantime, I'm a PhD student of the mechanical engineering in the department, uh, DMAS, Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in Polito. So the main uh, objectives of my uh, project is to uh, First, to test and assess the composite materials based on the automotive standards and try to develop a test program to examine their uh, crash worthiness. And uh, at the end, the uh, final object is to uh, do a crash sled test, which will work as a proof of concept for the whole uh, studies of the iconic uh, project. Uh, here is an image of the automotive standards that uh, I'm talking about. And the po potential impacts of my uh, PhD project uh, will be uh, developing an innovative uh, testing program and uh, also developing a crash box, to, uh, a composite crash box to be used in the car in order to help them to reach the new uh, standards by the EU for the consumption and the fuel and the CO2 and these uh, few gases gas emissions standards, I mean. And the final impact might be the application of the composites in the other parts, not only in the crash box, but in the, also in the other parts of the car. And the methodology that I'm using in order to reach my uh, objectives is the building block approach, which means that I start from the uh, bottom, from the coupon test, and then do the element test and the subcomponent test based on the results that I have uh, on the lower levels, I developed the test in the higher levels. The results so far in this one year is that uh, I've uh, done a literature review and uh, done the material screening and selection with the uh, meeting and uh, between the Polito and CRF. And also I've uh, decided which uh, coupon and element test I want to do. And here is a photo of a coupon test done uh, at the Baltrop uh, machine. In the, in the coupon level that shows the damage resistance of a composite material. And uh, here is a photo of a test in the element level, which has done on the omega shape uh, composites and uh, under quasi-statics. And the future works is that to continue a test on the coupon level and element level, and then try to make a test for the component level. Thank you so much for your time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ravin Garg, and I'm uh, following up with the same project that Iman just presented. Uh, I'm mostly on the computation side of things, so designing crashworthy automotive composite structures. Uh, the basic aim of the project is to assess uh, the current methodology that we have at CRF, and then to be able to design a new methodology, and also to design a composite crash box that could replace the uh, aluminum crash box that we have in uh, the Alfa Romeo 4C. Uh, that's a picture of it that you've seen earlier as well. Uh, also, we like to validate the design, the computation tools that we have with experiment data, which Iman would be conducting. Uh, moving on, the potential impact would be, as you can see in the chart above, uh, carbon, uh, carbon fiber composites have a higher energy absorption capacity as compared to traditional materials such as metals, aluminum, uh, other uh, composite systems. So we'd like to use this uh, property to be able to shift over to a different, uh, to composite crash boxes, actually. And this would help reduce emissions, so meet the EU goal, uh, increase passenger safety because they can obs uh, absorb a higher energy with the lower weight. And the methodology can then be used to uh, transfer other metal parts to composite parts. Uh, moving on. Up until now, the, we've uh, simulated 
drop, the, drop tower testing results, which have been on the a 20 joule impact on a polypropylene and a polyamide uh, plate uh, reinforced with uh, glass fibers. Uh, this is basically done in radios uh, using a material lot 25, which is able to uh, differentiate between tensile compression and shear loading whilst combining all of them together as well. Uh, and then using property type 11, which is just a composite property that can be used. Uh, we've been able to obtain some really good results uh, thus far with uh, how the simulation uh, progresses for the for the damage. And uh, the results have been good in terms of peak force that we have obtained, energy absorbed, and stroke as well. Uh, however, we haven't been really been able to capture the displacement, which is about 15% off. And also, the methodology right now is very sensitive to any small changes. And this is something that we like to work on in the future to avoid any sensitivity to small variations in uh, numerical parameters. As you can see, there's uh, friction effects can cause a, a lot of change, and then also interface effects can cause a lot of change in the final results. Uh, moving on, so like I said, to optimize the methodology to reduce sensitivity uh, to any changes uh, and uh, develop a methodology for uh, loading parallel to the fibers. And thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Stefano Della Pierre, and I'm currently a PhD student here at the Politecnico di Torino, and I'm working with uh, Professor Monica Ferraris. My PhD is focused on the joining and mechanical testing of materials, and today I want to talk uh, to you about uh, my activity on uh, surface modification of composites to increase their joint strength. So, as a first thing, let's see which is the aim of this work which is to improve the strength of composite joining, which is done by doing an acid etching of the surface to selectively remove the matrix and expose the first fiber layers. As you can see in the pictures, we have a usual composite with, with uh, long fibers and matrix, and the aim of the work is playing with uh, acid, so type of acid, concentration amount, time and temperature to just remove the first layer of matrix and expose the fibers without ruining the matrix which lays underneath. So the idea for this um, came from a project in which our role at Politecnico was the production, joining and production of ultra stable and low weight structure for space application, for example like satellites. But these processes can be employed every time joining of composite is required. So now we will show a little bit of the results we obtained. It's just a brief overview, let's say the main results. After doing the etching, we joined the samples together with an adhesive and we performed a shear strength test of the joined component. As you can see from the graph, we have uh, from the non-etched sample, we have an improvement of the joint uh, shear strength uh, with rising the temperature of this uh, etching procedure. And we have a significant improvement of the of composite joint shear strength, which is obtained with this acid etching. Uh, so now the question can be like, why we have this improvement of the strength of the composite joining? And here is explained with some uh, interface analysis we performed. We performed some surface and also some interface analysis through cross-section analysis at ACM uh, microscope. As you can see in the first picture, we have uh, the interface of a non-etched composite, where you can see that the interface between the composite and the adhesive is straight and clear, and all fibers lays inside the matrix. In the second picture, you can see the etched composite, where the behavior at the interface is completely different. Adhesive is in contact with the first fiber layer, and some fibers are even detached and embedded in the adhesive. So this type of behavior uh, leads to some advantages of the etching, and this is the reason for the improvement of the joint shear strength, because we have a, a higher composite surface area and a better adhesion between fibers and the adhesive. And also we have some fibers which have a bridging effect between the composite matrix and the adhesive itself. So if you want to see more information about this activity, I will be pleased to show you something more at my poster, which is number three. So I hope to see you at the poster session, and thank you for your attention. Morning, everyone. I'm Matteo Cosin. I'm an early stage researcher 
in the coach project uh, under the supervision of Professor San Germano and Salvo. But actually, I've been working most of my time in uh, element in Itchen, in England. Um, so uh, I heard this morning uh, plenty of very nice presentation about renewable energies and uh, innovative sources, but I'm going to bring you a bit down to hurt saying that uh, Fossil fuels are not gone away at any time soon. So th there is quite few very good reasons for this. And the truth is that the traditional reservoirs of these fossil uh, fuels are going exhausting quickly. And in the next future, access to these resources can become difficult. So oil and gas companies are striving to find more performing material, better performing material to access uh, such offshore um, reservoir that are called deep water offshore because they are below 3,000 meters, which is pretty long distance to reach, and the traditional materials are just not good enough. So they are looking to composite because, uh, because they are high specific uh, mechanical performances and because they don't corrode in a marine environment, which is a pretty critical issue. And, and also, like, they, are, they can be tailor in the in a way that it's much easier to deploy and maintain these these systems uh, another pretty important issue with offshore uh, oil recovery is that the ocean water is at four degrees or even below while the oil that flows inside the pipeline needs to stay a pretty high temperature uh, to be to be fluid enough to flow so we we focus on developing uh, an epoxy foam uh, epoxy are very good because they have uh, excellent joining uh, properties and are very chemically stable. And, uh, and um, we form that with a chemical agent, uh, which makes it better compared to syntactic forms or physical uh, agent forms, uh, but it makes it tricky, the curing process. So we have to, to characterize the, 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 the curing process in detail. And uh, following this, we manufacture samples to verify that the uh, thermal conductivity is, is effectually reduced and uh, to compare the mechanical properties compared to the bulk material. And we see that actually, considering, considering the lower uh, density of the material, it becomes competitive uh, for its property in when in particular the flexural loads are involved. That is a classical uh, kind of solicitation for pipelines. Uh, moreover, we wanted to verify like, what happens if we uh, reinforce our material creating a sandwich using GFRP skins, and uh, then we try to test the, the property of the adhesion that formed to these skins by three-point bending, and uh, we can see that uh, even if these two samples apparently are quite the same, hopefully the, the video is running uh, in a moment, but uh, we will see that uh, how uh, the, the fracture behavior is pretty different and the sample on the right uh, uh, actually fails before, fails the, the upper skin in compression before actually the foam gives up in its adhesion properties. So yeah, thank you, sorry for running a bit and if you want to find more information you can find me at post 4 Thank you very much. Hello everyone. As, uh the chairman said, my name is Sylvie Van, and uh, I've been working uh, in the uh, Element Materials Laboratory in uh, Hitch in the UK. The laboratory itself is uh, predisposed to oil and gas work, so I'm going to be touching on that like uh, my colleague Matteo Cavassin. Uh, and we're mostly going to be talking about composites in pipelines. Now, pipelines uh, are, the currently, are currently the most used means of... Uh, directing energy around the world. And you can see from this picture all of the different oil and gas pockets that we have around the world. And it's uh, through these uh, pipes that we're connecting all of these to processing plants or uh, different media. Now, this uh, mode of transportation is still cheaper than all the others. And by all the others, I mean uh, either boats or trucks or rail. And you can see that the difference in price is quite significant. Now, just in America alone, uh, as a comparison, in 2017, they moved 15 billion barrels of oil versus 262 million by train. So that's pipe versus train, to give you an idea. Uh, the pipes that we've had throughout history have gone through several uh, material types of so steel that we all know, uh, hybrid structures that combine both polymers and uh, steel. And moving forward, people want to go to strictly composite structures, even for uh, deep sea application. Uh, 
all, of course, all of these have uh, different advantages and disadvantages, but the composite structures are uh, moving strongly in this domain. So we have over one million kilometers of oil and gas transmission pipelines. Uh, unfortunately, most of these are still old steel pipes. They require replacement, they're failing, and uh, composites are the way of uh, moving forward in this and replacing them. So immense room for growth. Unfortunately, even composites age, they don't corrode, but they age, and they do fail. And we're trying to uh, analyze uh, how fast this occurs in order to provide uh, designers with data uh, so that they can predict the life of these uh, elements. Uh, they want them down there for at least 25 years. And unfortunately, we don't have 5,000 years of experience with composites as we do with metals. So the way to go about it to offer people this data is uh, Simple enough, mechanical testing, you can do so, but uh, we need to accelerate the way we get this data. No one's gonna spend money and 25 years to get data about a pipe that they already need to use. So we accelerated by uh, focusing on aging factors, and for composites, these are gonna be mechanical loads, time, temperature, and of course, chemical exposure, depending on what you're uh, gonna be transporting. So simple, um, Sorry, simple mechanical tests performed in very short time frames can give you data that you can then um, apply very simple principles to get, let's say, from 60 hours worth of, already finished? 60 hours worth of data to 25 years worth of data. You want to know more? I'm poster five. I'll be happy to give you any other explanation that you may require. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Gustavo Gonzalez, I'm a first year PhD student here at the Politecnico di Torino, and under the supervision of Marco San Germano and Fabrizio Pirri. Probably you hear about additive manufacturing in the last years, also known as 3D printing. This technology is called to revolutionize our society in the industrial world on a global scale. In fact, according to various reports, the interest for this technology has, in, uh, has increased in the last year and will continue growing in the future as well as the investment for it. It's fascinating how this technology allows the, allows the production of 3D printed materials by using simply our cell phone or computer, starting from a digital design. Nowadays, we're able to 3D print our house, our apartment. There are printing machines to 3D print uh, molecules. Even we're able to 3D print in the space with low gravity. As you can see, there are many different types of 3D printings and different ways to classify them. But from a materialistic point of view, polymeric 3D printing is the most developed branch in the field, mainly because the low cost of the printers and materials and the large scale of processable polymers when compared with metallic and ceramic processing. But despite the great technological advance in the last years, uh, can we really 3D print everything? Can we really 3D print optic uh, polymers, parts for use, for, for to be used in, for example, in computer or cell phone device? Not yet, something is missing. Actually, the polymer parts are, using, are used only for prototyping, hobby, proper modeling, and the best case for a structural application. So during my PhD study, I was looking for developing new printable materials, materials for obtaining functional polymer parts or composites to further expand the use of this technology toward new front uh, Our group, uh, actually in, in our group, we were able to develop printable material with good uh, electrical properties by adding fillers of nanotube uh, particles or uh, silver Actually, we were able to 3D print optical sensing. So if you want to more know more information about our group, I will in the poster session number six. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present the part of my work of the first PhD of the first year of, of the first year of my PhD, and I'm working with Professor Davide Janer and Daniel Milanese in the group that. Um, carries out some experiments on uh, uh, material for photonics and sensing. So um, the, I mean my, my talk will um, 
partly start from what, uh, what has been the previous talk and uh, to make you clear what I'm talking about, uh, we work on fiber and the, the actual um, well-known method to produce fiber and if we, if we want, for example, to produce a hollow fiber, a cylindrical hollow fiber, we need to do some, to produce some preform and we, we, we do that by means of a few methods like rotational casting, continuous casting, or coding and drilling are well-known and standardized methods, but with a lot of different uh, problems. And I have no time to uh, develop everything, but I, um, just to, to, to show you which is the, the starting point, we are uh, trying to do uh, extrusion. I mean, we are trying to, um, to put a piece of glass, a piece of uh, bulk glass inside uh, a furnace, and after um, heating and uh, applying pressure, we can produce different, different uh, geometries. And the, um, the best part of this technique is that uh, we can uh, produce non-cylindrical and asymmetrical geometries, which are uh, well known and well produced in, uh, in other ways. So um, this is the, um, uh, just to show you the setup of, of the system. So we have uh, a piece of glass and we, we just apply pressure and uh, by, by changing the matrix, the die that uh, is put on the, on the lower part of that, of that figure, we can, uh, we, can, we can have different kind of, uh, uh, of geometries and uh, this is really, really um, a good opportunity. Uh, but we have some problems. So one of that is the dwelling. I mean, the, the preform is going to, to enlarge after, after passing through the die. And the other problem that we are facing is the, um, the temperature profile inside our, our structure. So we are, we are trying to do different, uh, different studies and we are trying to, um, to simulate different condition and uh, also doing some thermomechanical simulation uh, by means of a, a simulation-based software. Uh, we can more or less predict the, the, the temperature distribu distribution inside the, um, this, this, this uh, machine. And, and we are trying to, to focus our attention on the possibility of um, putting together different materials, maybe with different, um, different temperature characteristics, and so uh, trying to uh, exploit all the field of multi-material fiber. And, uh, and we have great possibilities for the future. And thank you for your attention. Hello, everybody. I'm Christian Marro. I'm going to present the optical fiber sensors for early detection of degradation in glass fiber enforced polymer composites. So what is the aim of the project? So we want to develop a low-cost sensor um, suitable to be embedded inside the glass fiber reinforced polymer composites. So we want to fabricate an easy and, manual and scalable sensor that can provide a turning solution for the monitoring corrosive media. And of course, we want to demonstrate that these sensors has not any influence effect in the mechanical properties. So why? Imagine that we have a pipe, and this pipe suddenly um, get a rock down and degradate or has a crack. And then some chemicals can enter. So we want to monitor this degradation in able to, because we want to provide uh, early detection and then we can, um, we can, sorry, we can prevent some environmental disasters. So we can, that companies have to uh, afford costs and of course, um, if the pipe is in situated in the petrochemical station, we can provide some health and safety in the workplaces. So the advantages of the new optical fiber sensors is they are tenfold reduction costs if we compare to the FBG of the grating sensors. So imagine that we have a 10 meters pipe and one FBG costs around 100 uh, euros. So if we want to put one sensor per each meter, we will spend more money than if we put one sensor of that would cost, for example, in this case, one euro. So these sensors can be tailored, so we can make them sensitive for other chemicals. They are easy, scalable, and manufactured. They can be embedded inside polymers, such as polymers, adhesive, and inside glass fiber polymer composites. And they can be placed um, in hostile environments. Moreover, we are glad to say that we are in a patent pending in application of Politecnico. So just to show you quickly results, 
we were able to detect the water diffusion through the polymer composite and making gravimetric tests and we get the diffusion coefficient of the water, for example, and with using the fixed law, we were able to uh, correlate our sensing time with the theoretical one. More able, tolerating the sensors, we were able to detect hydrochloric acid, and of course, we make the mechanical testing, so we see that the sensors has not, uh, has just a small significantly effect in the mechanical properties. So in a conclusion, we were able to develop a new sensors, and the aging test showed that it was possible to detect the diffusion of chemicals through the polymers, and the sensors showed a good level of reproductibility and accuracy, and they were corroborated with the evaluation of the diffusion, and the presence has not any effect in the mechanical properties. So I invite you for my interactive poster, number eight, so I can explain you more details. Thank you. So you might have heard about the word uh, high energy demand and energy shortages caused by the uh, growth of the population and expansion of the uh, developing countries. So you might, uh, the politicians and media uh, they make it sound that you would believe that we actually need much more energy now and what we are aiming to is the higher energy production. Well, the truth is just about the opposite. The real energy crisis is that we have too much energy. So you want to ask yourself, what are we doing with all the energy we're producing right now? In 2011 only, 60% of the world generated electricity has been wasted. As a, heat, as a rejected heat, for instance. So can we transform that wasted heat into electricity? We believe that thermoelectricity is the solution. Thermoelectrics are the materials which convert heat into electricity. And if we connect those materials, PNN type semiconductor materials, into a, a electrically in series, they might, uh, they might provide us uh, needed electricity. But manufacturing of a thermoelectric device is a very sophisticated and very complex process. It's, it's made of many, many individual steps, such as material synthesis, material testing, then optimization, computing of these thermoelectric properties, uh, module design, and module fabrication. So we tackle that challenge in European thermodynamics, and we design and fabricate it high temperature thermoelectric module made of scooterized thermoelectric material, which were able to produce uh, at 450 degrees C temperature difference, uh, pretty high power, uh, 600 milliwatt. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, my name is uh, Fabiana Di Santo and uh, my research is focused on innovative oxidation protective coatings for thermoelectric uh, materials. Thermoelectricity is the generation of electricity through the Seebeck effect in response to a temperature gradient. At, uh, it is applied in energy harvesting and waste heat recovery. The application of uh, thermoelectric materials implicates some advantages, such as environment-friendly, high reliability, silent operations, and absence of moving parts. But they can be easily oxidized in at higher temperature in air. So, um, in fact, the current devices often work at low temperatures to avoid degradation. So, if they can be used at higher temperatures, their efficiency would improve. A dimensionless figure of merit is defined as a symbol uh, for a per um, thermoelectric performances. A thermoelectric module consists of uh, many couples of P and N type legs, um, and this is the oxidation. Uh, this is the position where the oxidation resistant coating is needed. But why is so challenging the using of glass and glass ceramic based coatings? Because they are low cost, thermally stable, and have low electrical and thermal conductivity. In addition, can have versatile compositions, and uh, their properties, especially the, um, the, the, um, the CTE, can be tailored to make them uh, suitable for coating of different materials. 
I am uh, working on free subs on a free type of substrate produced at nanoforts for iron manganese side. We can see now uh, ACM cross section of the glass ceramic coated HMS after 10 cycles. Um, after, after 10 thermal cycles, there is adhesion, no cracks, and no second phases at the interface. For electrical properties, ZT, depending on temperature, is given to show that HMS cycled with coating as an unchanged ZT compared to a centered one. So this glass ceramic uh, uh, system is, is a promising candidate for protect, protecting HMS against oxidation. The magnesium silicide doped with tin and antimonium is a very hard CTE. This is an example of a characterization from glass and glass ceramic to test the thermomechanical compatibility. Finally, there is the tetradrite coated with the commercial uh, water and solvent based resins. And the, from the XRD analysis, after a preliminary aging at 350 degrees, we can see that uh, the uncoated tetradrite show a lot of faces, especially the uh, antimony oxide, while uh, coated tetradrite uh, show only the single phase. Uh, electrical properties will uh, be done to demonstrate the efficiency of the um, the thermoelectric uh, coating. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Francesco Gucci. I'm a PhD in the um, Coach Group, and um, I'm hosted in Nanoforce Technology in the UK. My project is involved in the development and processing of nanostructure material, including thermoelectrics. Um, as you heard before, thermoelectrics can be used to generate energy um, from waste heat, or they can be used as solid state refrigerator. The efficiencies of our device depends on the figure of merit ZT, which uh, depends on uh, some par parameter which are electrical and thermal conductivity and CB coefficient uh, measured at a specific temperature. Now, this property uh, depends on the material composition and is dopant, so different material will have different properties in indeed. But they, they're also strongly influenced by the processing method, because the same material process in different way will have in the end, very different, uh, may have in the end very different properties. So our interest was to um, test what is the effect of fast heating rate on the thermoelectrics material. Um, using, we started using um, SPS, which is a state-of-art uh, state technique for the sintering of ceramic powder, which can reach ideally up to 1,000 degrees per minute, but more typically 100 degrees per minute, and sinter in several minutes. Its derivative flash SPS, as I said before, um, can, can sinter a um, precompacted pellet in seconds using very high heating rate, but not very suitable for thermoelectrics. So using some um, modeling so multi-physics modeling software, we were analyzing some possible solution, and we found that a possible solution is the use of a thin wall stainless steel die um, that, still, that allow us to process directly from powder <coughs> and still maintain this similar heating rate of several thousand degrees per minute uh, during the sintering. Um, I applied this method to, for the reactive sintering of a scutrodite based thermoelectric, obtaining high phase purity, high density, and improved properties when compared to um, conventional synthesis, conventional sintering, SPS. Um, while on uh, bis more commercial bismuth telluride, um, the effect of the hybrid flash was simply to shift the peak to a higher temperature, which is actually of interest for um, generator application. Um, I have tested other, other material, actually in collaboration with REN, so you'll see the results later. And I'm actually collecting some data on calcopyrite, which is a sulfide-based material, and half oil. So in conclusion, this new um, processing technique has potential for to be um, high, high, high quality and fast sintering technique. It has potential to be a reactive sintering method, but as many other technique, it seems that is um, the influence it has on, material, on the materials is strongly dependent on the material itself. So more tests are needed to understand which one are more suitable, and in particular. Um, I also think that the, optimi the optimized composition and dopant may depend, um, may be different from what have been optimized for other techniques. So um, more study will be needed to understand if this idea is correct. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. I'm Bhuvanesh Srinivasan from the University of Rennes, France. My PhD thesis is focused on developing novel chalcogenate based materials for thermoelectric application. 
Well, the previous speakers have already briefed about thermoelectrics and their applications, so let me not repeat those things. The only thing which I would like to remind is that to have high thermoelectric performance, the material must possess high Seebach coefficient, high electrical conductivity, and low thermal conductivity. During my PhD, we studied several classes of new materials for thermoelectrics, both by theoretical and by experimental means. At first, we looked at the idea of semiconducting chalcogenate based materials as potential thermoelectric material due to their inherently high Seebach coefficient and low thermal conductivity. Then we moved to glass ceramics, where we employed a novel approach of intentional crystallization of glasses by heavily doping with metals and semi-metals. Finally, we explored some polycrystalline materials, either by manipulating their composition to achieve favorable electronic band structures to enhance the electrical transport, or by optimizing their synthesis and processing conditions to achieve favorable nanoscale features to decrease their thermal transport. By doping copper to arsenic chloride glasses, we were able to increase the electrical conductivity by about five orders of magnitude without involving any crystallization. Um, with the help of synchrotron studies and multiple scattering based ab initio calculations, we were able to propose a physical mechanism for hole conductivity in these glasses. We have shown that the phonon glass electron crystal mechanism is feasible by uh, crystallizing the GET based glasses by heavily doping with bismuth, which helped to achieve high, uh, crystal like high electrical conductivity and glass like low thermal conductivity. Uh, we have improved the thermoelectric performance of lead tellurides by tuning their cation vacancies. By comparing the performance of materials that were processed by different synthesis techniques, we were able to um, understand the effect of processing conditions on their thermoelectric performance. Finally, we successfully manipulated the electronic band structure of GET by co-doping with gallium and antimony, which helped in valence band convergence by decreasing the energy separation between heavy hole and light hole bands. These materials that were processed by hybrid plus HPS technique, which Francesco explained in his talk, helped us to achieve a stable high figure of merit of close to two, which is stable from 600 to 773 Kelvin. Well, with this, I conclude my, the summary of my PhD, and as this is the last meeting, I would sincerely Thank Coach Program for the amazing opportunity that it has provided for the past three years. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Hassan Javed, and I am working on design since the characterization of uh, glass and glass ceramic materials for solid oxide electrolysis cell application. Uh, as Christian told before, that solid oxide cell works in two different modes. One is called solid oxide electrolysis mode that converts the, uh, oh, sorry. That, uh, that converts the electrical energy generated from different renewable energy sources into the chemical energy such as hydrogen by direct electrolysis of water. But in the other mode, it is called solid oxide fuel cell mode. It works in the other way around and converts chemical energy into the electrical energy. The solid oxide cell composed of different repeating units and such as the MIA glass, um, MIA which is a cell and then the glass ceramic sealants and then the different units are combined with each other with the help of a metallic interconnect which is made up of a made up of, of high chromium steel known as crofer. So in this part of my project, I am working first of all on the sincere characterization of novel glass ceramic sealants for SOEC applications and tested them into the real working conditions such as high temperature, applied voltage, and simultaneously in oxidizing and reducing environments. While in the other part of my work, I am working on deposition of protective coatings upon the metallic interconnect in order, in order to hinder the chromium evaporation at high working temperature of SOEC. Uh, just briefly explaining my results, uh, we have synthesized novel glass ceramic sealants that initially shows promising compatibility with other neighboring components of SOEC. We have tested them in long terms at 850 degrees Celsius in the dual atmosphere for 800 hours, and these novel glass ceramic sealants showed promising uh, electricity proper electrical properties such as high electrical resistivity and we didn't detect formation of any undesirable uh, compounds after 800 hours of testing. After that, we have deposited this glass onto the, at industrial scale and by stencil printing uh, technique and for that we have developed the novel paste with the optimized rheological properties. In the second part, uh, we worked on deposition of protective coatings upon the interconnect. We started from the lab scale by using the small samples, and then we have upgraded this, upscaled this process to deposit the coating upon the real interconnects, which has to be used in the, into the industry. We have also made their area specific resistance for almost 9,000 hours at 850 degrees Celsius. And the SEM results shows that the EPD technique is quite promising not only to 
quote, the small samples at lab scale, but also the real interconnects, uh, which has to be used at the inter industrial scales, and they produce quite uniform coatings. And the last step, uh, we, we are using these uh, glass, uh, we are using the promising glass compositions, as well as the coated crofer plates into the real stack in the real SOEC conditions for 2,000 hours. I would, and at the end, I would like to thank all of you for your kind attention. Hello, my name is Mohammad Yasir Akram, and I am working with Professor Monica Ferraris and Dr. Rolandina on joining of oxide oxide composites for high temperature applications. Talking about the oxide oxide composite, basically they are composed of oxide fibers and oxide matrices. And they have oxidation resistance, have low density and high thermal mechanical properties. So uh, they can be used instead of the uh, metallic alloys for high temperature applications. Uh, uh, research giants like uh, uh, GE, NASA and Boeing are working a lot on these kinds of composites. And also there are a couple of programs uh, working in Germany for, these, for the development and validation of these kinds of composites. Uh, talking about the aim of the project, the aim of the project is to join oxide oxide composites with itself for high temperature applications and the joint samples must be oxidation resistance, mechanical sound and uh, thermally stable. For this study, our, our, calib our calibrations are with the uh, University of Bayreuth and um, uh, Fraunhofer, Germany. Talking about the uh, results uh, for, uh, the, for the joining of composites, actually we started with metallic brazes but unfortunately they have poor oxidation resistance so we switched to silicon silica-based uh, glass ceramics, and we have very good uh, joining results. We have also uh, aged the joint sample for 100 hours, and the interface is very, very good, and free from defects and discontinuities. Also, uh, we have performed a couple of mechanical testing, started with single lap offset, and every time the composite delaminates, and for the fo also we have performed four-point bending test at, uh, for as received thermally treated and joined, and, uh, and at high temperature at, at 50 degrees centigrade, and the most promising result is uh, that we have able to obtain 81 megapascal which, uh, at 850 degrees centigrade. And every time the, the, the uh, fracture is cohesive, uh, so, so we can conclude that the glass ceramics are promising candidate to join these kind of composites. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alessia Mazzini, and I'm a uh, early stage researcher at the Institute of Physics of Materials in Brno, Czech Republic. And my work deals with the characterization of ceramic system for solid oxide cells, in particular on the role of the interfaces between layers on the final integrity of the systems. As already Asan and Christian from Sunfire nicely introduced, solid oxide cells are really promising uh, technology that can revolutionize the energy market because they have a really high overall efficiency. They're eco-friendly and they're really reliable. Uh, on the other hand, though, they have to um, work at really high uh, temperature and they undergo really high mechanical and thermal stresses. So their mechanical reliability is threatened. And as already shown before, a uh, solid oxide cell stack is made, made up of different repetition units. The number of them depends on the power output that we require. And of these repetition units are made of different components. In our work, we decided to focus on the MEA, that is the ceramic component, and it's where the uh, mechanical uh, and electrochemical reactions occur. And we decided to focus focus on this component because we know that the mechanical failure of one of them can compromise the overall efficiency of the whole system. And in order to understand how the um, manufacturing process will affect the final uh, mechanical stability and integrity of this system, we prepare different samples. So we started from the electrolyte that is in this case is the supporting layer and we screen printed the subsequent layers one by one. This um, way we obtained four different layer structures that you can see here and we tested them uh, in different loading configuration in order to understand how the interaction between layers will affect the final mechanical properties and integrity of the system with the final aim of, improve, of improving uh, the reliability of the uh, ceramic component we're talking about. So we started with the uh, characterization of the elastic constants and as you can see here, we perform different tests, the resonance test, the three-point bending test, and the tensile test, and out of all of them, uh, we um, 
obtained the elastic constants. From the recent test, we've, we have been able to obtain both the shear and el elastic modulus. From the three-point bending and the tensile test, we obtain the elastic modulus. And you can see in the bar graph here that resumes all the results together uh, that every time we add a layer to the electrolyte, so we screen print a, a, a functional layer on the electrolyte, the el elastic modulus decreases. So there's a weakening of the structure. We measured as well the strength of this uh, component on two different uh, configurations and three-point bending tests and ball and three-ball tests, and those are the results. And we can finally conclude that um, every time we add a layer to the electrolyte, so during the uh, pr manufacturing process, there's a significant weakening of the structure. And in fact, both the elastic modulus and the strength decrease. If you want to know more about my work, I will wait for you at poster number 14. Thank you very much. Okay, good, good uh, morning, everybody. And I'm Elisa Muzzi, and I will start uh, my PhD in November. And this is my work, uh, Soldier Root for Glass Synthesis from Nanoparticle to Bulk. Uh, I focus my attention, uh, firstly, uh, to the application. Um, for example, multifunctional uh, nanoparticles, silica nanoparticles, after um, with the uh, silica core uh, um, titania shell, and about bulk, um, for example, uh, thin coating for a sensor or um, silica platform for uh, fiber glasses. Uh, my work started uh, from uh, the synthesis of silica nanoparticles that uh, in the first uh, without doping, and in the second uh, uh, step, uh, doping with uh, neodymium. And uh, same time, in the same time, uh, I started uh, the synthesis of uh, titania nanoparticles. And uh, in this case, I use another kind of synthesis with reflux and uh, 90 degrees. About bulk, uh, uh, the um, the, I have uh, many difficulties be because uh, the synthesis is more long, and uh, I decided to explore uh, two routes, one inorganic route with nitrates, and uh, the other one with uh, acetates. Uh, the different uh, results are very um, <laughs> evident, clear, uh, as you can see, but uh, the, I decided that during my synthesis of um, 10 samples, uh, to separate one of these uh, and uh, without acetates and without uh, modifier of glasses. And so uh, there, is a, uh, there was an unexpected result because uh, only um, putting only uh, acetic acid and uh, teos, I, um, I, I can see the um, transparent glasses uh, at, uh, after the th thermal treatment of 60 degrees. So, uh, and before uh, um, I, do, um, I did uh, some analysis in SAM, and I can see uh, very, very small nanoparticles. So, in conclusion, uh, silica and titanium synthesis are very, very good uh, um, synthesis, uh, and uh, we have to study only the reputability. And uh, about glasses, uh, I attend the, a, a transparent silica bulk glasses, but for uh, um, mon to obtain uh, monolith, um, I want to study the use of acetic acid and improve the characterization of structure analysis uh, and uh, for incorporation modifier in the glass. So, thank you for uh, your attention. If you have uh, some question, see you at poster session. Thank you.